A book titled Life with My Idiot Family sounds like it could be a comedy about the normal ups and downs of modern day life. It is anything but. Sexual abuse survivor and pension award winner Kathy Picard and her husband Gary came in to tell us about their book detailing her painful upbringing and the victory she won over her abuser. I need to address as many people as possible to get the word out that you can be a survivor, you can be a thriver, even though your life has um, entailed being sexually abused. How painful for you to, I mean, you knew the story, but to sit there and see it written down, to see it in black and white on a page, it, it's, it's scarring, it's searing. It was agonizing because she had told me things that she had never told me before. And when you care about somebody, you know, but it was a story that has, had to be told, um, and, ho and hopefully it will help and reach, reach a lot more people. We'll talk more as we progress, but uh, Kathy, uh, you focused your work in the last few years on getting the law changed in Massachusetts in terms of statute of limitations on sexual abuse cases, and it took a long time, and it took a lot of work, and a lot of trips down the pike to Boston, but you did it. I think it was what? It was 2014. You were there with Governor Patrick. He signed the bill that greatly extended the time to be able to go after, to report and go after someone for abuse. Yes. The uh, criminal statute of limitations was extended September 21st, 2006. And for the, um, for the criminal, that actually gives a survivor to the age of 43 now to go forward. And for civil, it gives a survivor to the age of 53 because that law changed June 26, 2014. And I was very honored. Our politicians, they listened. Yes, I made a lot of phone calls, a lot of knocking on doors, meeting them, telling them my personal story, letting them know that we need to change the statute of limitations for survivors to be able to go forward and get justice. And... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was the very day, or maybe it was the next day, but it was, it was soon, you filed a civil suit in federal court against your alleged, at that time, abuser, your stepfather, I did. and you immediately went ahead. I did. I was actually at the public signing with the governor, actually, after he signed the bill with the pen, um, which I was very honored to receive that pen. That was just something that I'll always you know, honor that. But as soon as he signed the bill, I actually texted my attorney, John Stewart, and I said, let's go. And that's when we started the case. Okay. <clears throat> let's, let's go forward to that. That was uh, the case you won in 2015. Several days of testimony. You're in court. You're, I'm going to say abuser now because we don't have to say alleged anymore. Okay. The court's found against your stepfather, being back in that courtroom for both of you, seeing this person, had you ever seen him before? I, I don't know. You'd never seen this person before. What, what was that like for you? It was, it was difficult to see him. Yeah, I can only imagine. And, and you're back. I, I know, correct me if I get this wrong now, but I believe a brother of your stepfather testified against him. Right. Your stepsister testified for her father. So here, here's the idiot family <laughs> torn apart in a million ways, huh? Exactly, exactly. It's, you know, you had two out of three stepsisters siding with his story, and then you had my uncle who came and testified because he had heard things when I was a young girl. So he actually, his pastor told him, you need to tell the truth, and that's exactly what he did. He told the truth. And the eight panel jur jurors, they, you know, of course, sided with my story, which is the truth. I know they, they awarded you a, a quarter million dollars in damages. I don't know if you ever collected, and you said at the time, it's, it's no, no, because who has a quarter of a million dollars? Right. You didn't. But you said right then, you said, it's not about the money. It's not about the money. No, it's definitely not about the money. It's justice. It's to be able to bring him into the courtroom now that the statute of limitations changed and have him him have to you know say that he didn't do it which in fact he did but it's it's the fact of bringing him to court and that's the justice that I got
having to, to do that. And a lot of survivors, they're unable to go to court for whatever reason, um, whether it be the statute of limitations or whether it be that they just can't do that, but they need to know that they can survive. It's, it's all about making us all aware of what may be going on right around us, maybe the family next door, maybe our own family, and, and right to understand. In homes, right in the homes. I mean, the statistics are very alarming. One in every four girls before their 18th birthday, one in every six boys before their 18th birthday. 93% of the perpetrator is known to the victim. So we are letting them into the homes, but by educating and educating kids as soon as they're able to talk. We need to start educating kids about the good touch, bad touch, you know, not to keep secrets, that they're being told to keep it a secret. You know, we need to let them know that they need to tell if somebody is inappropriately touching them. And yet how hard it is. I mean, a person you'd go to, a parent, in your case, was the abuser for a child at, at seven, I think, at, at seven. the first touching, molestation started. A child's just lost as to what to do or where to go, I would right, think. Right, right, because they don't understand. They don't understand that a certain feeling or a certain action that's being done to them is wrong. So that's why we need to bring this education into the schools, you know, right away. And that's where I'm finding the hard part is getting into the schools. You know, like you mentioned, the police academy. I do speak at the police academy. I need to educate our police officers. So when they're on their job and they approach a little girl or a little boy that's been abused, what can they do? You know, their tone of the voice, their eye contact is very important. The numbers you cite are just unbelievable. It's a pretty good chance somebody watching has suffered this or, or maybe has a suspicion something isn't quite right in a family they know or their own family. To, what can they do? What should they do briefly? They should, um, first of all, you need to talk to this child, ask the child if something's wrong, but not in front of, of course, the perpetrator. You need to go to the police station. You need to report this. It's or very important to, to or report Or talk to a trusted adult. Um, yeah. If you can't talk to mom or dad, trusted adult, a friend, a teacher. Or friend's parents, a teacher, a, teacher. a counselor, yeah. just talk to somebody and let it be known that some, somebody is touching you. 1-800-4-A-CHILD, you can get more legal advice than that if you, if you want to call that number, and you can get the appropriate person to speak to in your community. It's so important. Gary Picard, Kathy Picard, thanks for the book. Thanks for coming in.